Good day and welcome to Spotlight, the periodic news and information program on your own channel 977 and up on YouTube about people and events of interest to Lake Monticello. On behalf of the LMOA broadcast group, I'm Ron Kraus. Today the spotlight falls on David Wells, uh, Lake Monticello's new public service director who joined LMOA recently after a distinguished career at the Fluvanna County Sheriff's Department. David Wells, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the broadcast and to the lake in general. Thank you for having me. As an intro to who you are and where you came from, why don't you give us your QV, if you would, where you were born and raised and educated? Oh, all right. Um, I was actually born in Little Rock, Arkansas, North Little Rock Air Force Base. My dad was a uh, Air Force captain, uh, so that's how I was born there. Uh, being in the military, we moved around a little bit. He wound it up. He retired from the Air Force and took a job with DOD, which netted us at uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, down outside of Colonial Heights. Mm. So I grew up in the Colonial Heights area for most of my life, uh, since I was probably seven years old, all the way through high school. Um, in that city. That's actually where I started my law enforcement career as well, but I guess we'll get into that later. Uh, I went to uh, Richard Bland College there in Petersburg and did oh, some yeah. other studies at Virginia Commonwealth University and James Madison University. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, you know, you've, hit, uh, you've hit three good ones. Uh, so, uh, how did you get into law enforcement? I've asked myself that many a nights <laughs> after a long day <laughs> what am or, I doing here? or a hard case. And the honest answer is I'm not really sure. I was working retail out of college and while I was in college and uh, my sister's husband's uncle I believe was an auxiliary police officer with the city of Colonial Heights and somehow when I was talking to them and I think a cookout one day it sounded something interesting I knew I didn't want to spend my career in retail and I knew you know from originally I went to college I was going to be an engineer and I, that first calculus and physics class proved to me I was not going to be an engineer no, yes. so I need to do a career change and uh, just I started off as an auxiliary police officer and just kind of kept going at it. Hmm. And uh, your advancement down there, how long were you there? I was there for about two years, from about 1995 to 1997. Uh, back then it was a very different hiring time. When you're looking for police jobs, you might have one opening and 100, 200 people you know, going to test for it. Wow. Much different than the challenges we face now. Hmm. And um, you, so then after the two years, uh, where did you move on to? I got hired by the Division of Capital Police, which is the police agency for the state capital in Richmond. Um, so I worked there just briefly for a little under a year. That got me certified. They sent me through the academy. I actually went to the oh, police okay. academy at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and then from there, I ended up going to Waynesboro Police Department over in the Valley. Uh, just by happenstance, a friend of mine, when I was in training, a friend of mine had worked for Waynesboro, and they were, showed up in the same class. Hmm. And I was telling them, they're, you know, for a 25-year-old, the Capitol Police was not exactly the exciting law enforcement career that <laughs> right. you saw on TV. Right. I sat in a lot of empty buildings at night and pulled on a lot of doorknobs. Oh, Lord. Um, so he goes, hey, we're hiring, you know, four people. So he said, like, you should come on up. So I said, all right. So I drove up and tested and got hired in Waynesboro. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for three years or so. I was a police officer, got promoted to investigator after about a year on the job. I uh, also was on the agency SWAT team. And then from there I left to go to the Alcock Beverage Control Bureau of Law Enforcement. Oh, okay. Oh, and, so. Yeah, I moved around a little bit when I was young. Um, yeah. I was a special agent with them, signed to some narcotics task force, and then got promoted to a senior special agent. Uh, I was actually doing industrial alcohol compliance. <laughs> oh, well now. That's, yeah, which was that's, quite a switch from SWAT I, team and drug task force. I did. Um, that's actually why I left. I was like, I don't want to do this. You no. know, this is not being a police officer. This is licensing farm wineries. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, I knew I didn't want to go back really to patrol work and go work shift work on the road. So I was looking for another investigator spot because I really enjoyed that. And Fluana County had one in the newspaper. Well, how about so okay. that's how I ended up in Fluana County six, over 16 years ago. 16. All mm -hmm. right. And so you tell us about your uh, advancement there. 
Well, I got hired uh, as an investigator, so I went straight into investigations. I was an investigator for maybe a year or so. I got promoted to a corporal of investigations and pretty much ran the division. From there, I became lieutenant of investigations. Uh, I was that for, geez, I don't even have my resume, but several, several years. I really enjoyed uh, criminal investigative work, uh, so I ran the entire investigation section. Mm. At the various points, it also encompassed like school resource officers or animal control. I uh, got promoted. Uh, shortly, I think after Sheriff Hess got elected to uh, operations captain, which oversaw both the patrol divisions and the criminal investigations division, as well as school resource and uh, animal control and the reserve program we had. And then from there, right before I retired, probably about a year, two years before I retired, I was promoted to the chief deputy position, which is the second command. He was the second, yeah. You know, pretty much oversees all the operations. Second in command down there. So you actually retired yes, from, from Fluvanna. Oh, I, I, I wasn't aware, aware of that. So uh, then what attracted you all of a sudden out of the blue here? You were going to go play golf now for a change well, or no, something. Oddly I, enough, I don't know how to play golf, but... Uh, <laughs> Virginia has a wonderful retirement system for law enforcement where you can retire with 25 years of service at age 50. Oh, boy. And by oh, too young. <laughs> pure happenstance, well, I still got to work. So by yeah, pure happenstance, uh, this became open in June, which was my 50th birthday and my 25 years of service mark. Well, how about that? So uh, the star is kind of aligned, and I was going to stay with the sheriff at least to the next election. Um, but, you know, when this came open, I've lived in the lake for 14 years. Oh, yeah. So this is my backyard, you know. Oh, uh. um, So when it came open and the office is less than a mile from my house, you know, I was like, well, this might. And it's a private agency, so it does not affect my state retirement. Okay. So the uh. double dipping was a factor. Oh, um, my. To be honest. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I got a chance to do what I like to do. I thought it would be a good chance to help the community where I've lived for 14 years. Oh, gosh, yeah. Help kind of rebuild and regrow the agency given the current you know circumstances and just the way you know everything works these days modernize it a little bit uh, really focus on community service um, so everything's kind of fell into place to be perfectly honest I wasn't really looking to retire yet but the you yeah. know when things happen sometimes it might be a sign or just time to try it yeah yeah well as a, uh, at that time we uh, certainly were in were in need uh, we were down two or three officers and apparently not having much uh, success in, in attracting them. What are, what are actually, what are your job specs here? Well, I'm still learning some of those as we go. Um, basically, I'm the director of public safety and chief of police. So they tried to create a different public safety model that includes both the security section and the police section and, uh, and also um, emerging ma emergency management function as far as just operations. You know, we have three dams that are regulated and maintenance takes care of that, but we do like some prep drills, like when this Hurricane Ian we thought was gonna hit, you know, we had mm -hmm. a team meeting with our local uh, involved people just to make sure we were prepared. So emergency preparation is also part of that title. So the biggest part for right now is just kind of getting the police department back up to uh, staffing and updating some policies and procedures and just trying to make sure we're doing efficient operations, providing the services everybody here you know, pays for. Mm -hmm. We're a supplemental agency. You know, being private police, we're different and very unique from, you know, municipality and the municipal police department. So I always kind of say that the, uh, you know, sheriff's office is the ice cream where the sprinkles on top. Yeah, okay. You know, we're that little extra something. We're a value-added service. You know, all the residents, myself included, pay, you know, we pay our dues. We also pay our county taxes. Yep. So we need all the services <clears throat> of the sheriff's office. Yep. But we're that little quicker response. We're that more community-focused response. You know, we get calls I you know, had a gentleman, I think his ladder fell here on his roof. He couldn't get a hold of his neighbor, so he called us. We come back, help his ladder up. You know, sometimes people have trouble with, you know, one of my neighbors has an issue with the garage door. I think we've been there two or three times just so she can get her car out. So we can do that stuff where the sheriff really doesn't have the resources. And, you know, they could yeah. be in Kent yeah. store or, or Scottsville on a call. So yeah. we can help with that, as well as if you have an emergency, we can get there a lot quicker. Yeah. Uh, we, we start responding back to some medical service calls. That's uh, usually I, when I when I've seen it, the um, the patrol car is preceding the ambulance very 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 often and and assists on a lot of those cases. And I think the residents really like that or appreciate oh, yeah. it. You know, a lot of times they just need some lift assistance or you know there's a couple of people that just need help getting somebody out of the car. You know, if we don't need to type an ambulance for that or if we can help versus calling out two ambulances or an ambulance or a fire truck, you know that's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah, and as I recall. 
How many of your folks, you used to, if you lock your keys in the car for some reason, you used to have a, a jimmy stick. I remember your predecessor. We do have some, would, some lockout kits. Uh, we're you? not sliding the uh, metal down the door anymore. There's too oh, many okay. electronics in those. Oh, that's true. The new thing is this uh, air wedge, and you got to try to finagle this basically a fancy coat hanger through and try to catch the knob so you don't damage oh, yeah. inside the door. Yeah. We still do that. Uh, okay. well, some people do it better than others. Good don't to, call me good because I might not get in the car for you. <laughs> it's, good, it's good to know. Yeah, we have been able to hire uh, two deputies recently, apparently, and uh, so that helps to, uh, to bring those numbers up And because uh, I guess otherwise we had to rely a little bit more on the, uh, the Sheriff's Department for patrols. Yes, and one of the things we wanted to focus on was getting better integration with the sheriff's office. You know, this is, everybody here is a Flavani County resident, like I said, they all pay taxes. I have no trouble accepting help from, the, you know, from anybody that, that has a badge and a gun that's gonna come help on a call. Well, and that's why I'm trying to get folks, you know, if you need police, if you need fire, if you need rescue, call the sheriff's office dispatch. They dispatch for us. You know, we don't maintain our own dispatch center. We don't have the staffing or the funding for that. You know, the main gate does the best they can, but if you've ever been in there and when it's busy, they got a diesel truck over here, they're trying to take a phone call over here, mm -hmm. it's hard for them to get all the information. Where the sheriff's office, they have a team of trained dispatchers, and there might be where the lake officer might already be on a call, but there might be a sheriff's deputy who's just driving down South Boston Road, and the call could be right inside a slice gate. Yep. So we want to get a dispatch to the quickest unit, not necessarily whether it's a sheriff or a, or a police officer. Mm -hmm. We want to get somebody there as quickly as possible. So we're trying to get them to call the 589-8211, the non-emergency sheriff's number for, you know, police-related calls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that uh, that system down at the sheriff's office. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite it's impressive. It's terrific. And yeah. we have quite a large investment in it, that uh, oh, yeah, computer really, dispatch system. Yeah, lights on the board is where these calls are and who's where, et cetera. It's that, a lot more efficient than the notepad that we have in the... Uh, main gate so we want to make sure we get people to call call them and it just gets your services quicker plus it creates a good document trail uh, yeah. if there is an issue down the road yeah so we've managed to hire two new police officers i'm still looking for one more i've got a couple interviews set up next week so i'm hoping to kind of max out the magic number i'm looking for is five right now okay um, within our budget restraints that's a that's a realistic number given today's labor market and prices of labor okay have you, uh, have you had any challenges uh, kind of integrating the Allied security people with our own police force? Well, it's two pretty much totally different functions, and that's what a lot of people don't think realize. You know, their primary job is asset protection, protecting the amenities and the property that the lake owns. You know, if you call for a police officer, you're not going to get a security officer showing up at your house. Mm -hmm. You know, they're helping us. I mean... And it sounds petty, but one of the biggest things they've helped us with is replacing gate arms and access control. They're here for that access control function and to protect our amenities. We get gate arms broken off all the time. And versus sure thing. versus having to send a police officer to go out there and change a gate arm, you know, the security staff can do that. You know, we used to do a lot with locking and unlocking buildings. That's something mm -hmm. that security does so the police <clears throat> officer can stay free to do the, the police duties. And then mainly, you know, just checking in through the gates and just checking on golf course, marina, things like that. Try to be an extra set of eyes for us, you know, should something happen. So they're mm -hmm. not they're not a replacement. They're just kind of a augmentation. Okay. And uh, speaking of what you call the access control system, our our gates, um, you say that they are basically beyond their beyond their service life, and uh, they're going to need replacement before long. And What's that all going to involve? Besides well, <laughs> that remains to be seen. I'm learning a lot about our gates and our gate system. And it's like everything else, technology, you know, keeps marching on. And those gates get a tremendous amount of wear and tear. Yeah. You know, if you ride down the road, you don't see how much, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of traffic in this community. But go sit at the Monish Gate for 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or Turkey Sag Gate for 10 minutes and see how many cars and how many times that arm goes up and down, up and down. Yeah. Just like anything that's used a lot, you know, it wears out. Those are all software driven. You know, we have a specific program that was purchased several years ago um, that's no longer is service. Just like Windows changes their systems, you know, this one is kind of beyond its shelf life as far as updates and upgrades. So we're looking at options to make sure we maintain the proper control system, um, you know, what's more efficient, other ways technology can improve the guest experience and the resident experience, you know, versus having to pick up the turkey sag phone, which is a little antiquated, and yeah. a lot of people touch it. Is there some technology we could use? Is there something using cell phones and 
you know, oh boy. You, you get your tea time here, is there something where we can send you a code, a one-time code to come in versus having to go through, like that current keypad we have to go through daily and change the code manually. So it's just a little past its prime as far as the software and just the ease of use and the efficiency. So we've actually met with a couple vendors to get kind of a progression plan. I don't want to wait till something breaks mm -hmm. to, to figure out how we can fix it. I want to make sure we're on top of it and go, well, right now this part's good, but then the next thing you need to replace is maybe the software for the, for the barcode system. That's not no, the I best. See. And then down the road, we can look at an access management system. You know, the gate arms itself are pretty standard mechanics. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to make sure we're doing everything efficiently as we can and make sure we have a, a plan B if something does go wrong or, you know, a tractor yeah. trailer takes out one of our whole gate oh, boost at Turkey Sag. Oh, like that could happen. Yeah, it's, well, it got close one time. It hit our phone. <laughs> Luckily, we had some spare parts in hand. Oh, Me my. and the maintenance director figured out how to change it. So oh, my. just want to make sure we're looking forward and always have plans in place. And ha what can we do better? What can we improve? Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, at the uh, the August board meeting that uh, with basically uh, allied uh, between the two, allied in our own police force, we have been able to uh, increase basically a, a presence on the streets. Yes. Um, I started when I got here a sector patrol program. I basically had the lakes divided up into five sectors and the six, well, six sectors actually, and six being the a Cherokee section outside the gate, pretty much mirrored off our five beaches. It's just easy for me mm -hmm. to remember. And that way I can log and make sure the officers are hitting all the streets in those sectors. Um, through we, we log it through the Sheriff's Dispatch Center so I know how much time they spent in the sector. And it's just important that we don't just ride around Jefferson all the time. You know, mm -hmm. We want to make sure we hit these side streets. Yep. You know, everybody pays the same dues no matter where you live, so we're going to make sure they're getting that same service. And then just get more visibility out there because a lot of people just like to see that police car driving down the road. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's kind of uh, kind of comfortably comforting yeah. uh, just as uh, when there's a, a car at at home, including even the sheriff's department. Right. You see a, a lot of cars parked at places around, and uh, that's that's nice. It's a uh, great deterrent. And also, God forbid something happens, you've got that many more people immediately available. Right. Well, we're, we're lucky. There's probably. <clears throat> 20 or 30 various law enforcement officers from yeah. the sheriff's office, surrounding agencies that live, you know, out in our community. So it certainly doesn't hurt. And like I said, I'll take the take the help wherever I can get it. Right, right. You had uh, at the board meeting a very copious chart referring to service calls. And what what what's the leading category? Do we have any particular thing regarding crime? There's really not one that's more than or other. I mean, you know, we're a residential community. When you have close to 12,000 people butted up, every once in a while you're going to have some issues. You know, disturbance calls are probably our biggest issue, be it domestic disturbances or just neighbors not getting along. Um, yeah. Or just, you know, a lot of that also is unruly kids. You know, non-crime calls, we do a lot of welfare checks, adult welfare checks and child welfare checks, where somebody, you know, like, hey, I haven't been able to hold my grandmother. Can you ride by and make sure she's okay? <clears throat> Not that nine times out of ten everything's fine, but you know if there's a medical issue or somebody fell, you know we get calls and can help them back up. Um, you know we have some larcenies, uh, some property damage. The mailboxes get backed into or ran over quite frequently. Um, <coughs> you know those are kind of our bread and butter calls: animal complaints, barking dogs. Oh yes. Um, you know what I call your basic community complaints. You know you do have your occasional, uh, you know your, like I said your larceny. It's usually most of those are crimes of opportunity. Somebody left their weed or sitting out mm -hmm. by the road and somebody comes by and steals it. Uh, bicycle theft, things of that nature. Yeah. You know, and that's not to say more serious things do happen, but we've been very fortunate. For a population yeah. of size, our crime rate on those type of things are pretty low um, as far as like violent offenses, mm -hmm. you know, as far as... Every once in a while, I, I know there has been in the past uh, those, maybe some young just going by a uh, street or even even parking areas and uh, testing cars to see what's open, uh, et cetera. So I didn't tell my kids if they come, did you lock your car, even though we're well up off the yeah, street? Yeah, well, you should always lock your vehicle. And most of the crimes that happen are targets of opportunity. Yeah. You know, if you lock your car, lock your house, lock your stuff up, you know, should you have to, no, but this is not the utopian world. You know, just do a couple little mm -hmm. things. You can prevent most of that. About every year since I've been at the sheriff's office and now here, it's usually either the ending or the beginning of summer, there's going to be a rash of car thefts from vehicles. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not mm -hmm. saying it has anything to do with kids going back to school or not, but, <laughs> 
you know, and it's it's always unlocked cars. We have very few with actually damaging the vehicle. Yeah. They're just testing the cars with open. Right. If you leave your iPad or right. your wallet or your purse in there, it, yeah. it's going to get taken. So we always try to remind people, just don't leave valuables in your car in plain sight. Just lock it up. By all means, don't leave firearms in your car. No gosh, no. That happens about once a year, too. If huh. someone leaves a firearm in an unsecured vehicle, and then if this happens, it gets taken. Um, so, you know, if you're going to do that, be a responsible owner and take it in and secure it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, do we have any metrics, any comparison with, with crimes with maybe, I don't know, five years ago, anything like that? I don't have any with me, um, but just for my, like I said, I've been at the sheriff's office, I was there for 16 years, so I've been in the area for a while. Of course, COVID always kind of throws off any oh, yeah. metrics you're working on because people's whole lifestyles and movement patterns change. But Fluvanna County as a whole has a fairly low crime rate and has for the past several years. And it's actually gone down, I believe, for the most part across all categories, which was a national trend during COVID. Of course, a lot of people stayed home. Speeding actually went through the roof during COVID because there weren't as many amazing? cars on the road yeah. and people were flying. We had people in the county going 70, 75 yeah. miles an hour, which was odd. You wouldn't expected that. And some fraud calls went up, computer related frauds. Um, those are always going to happen regardless of where you're at. But as a whole, it's a slightly decreasing crime rate. Um, for a county of the size, we're very, very lucky. Hmm. Yeah. You, uh, in your board presentation, you, matter of fact, uh, did make some comparisons between, uh, we're among, the lake and uh, uh, nearby places like Louisa, Farmville, uh, smaller populations with re comparable, if not rather far larger budgets. Yeah, and the point I was trying to make there is, you know, I, I hear sometimes when people are dissatisfied with their service level, you know, what am I paying for? And when you have to look at what we pay in our dues, it's relatively small with the amount of service you're getting. And that's why I kind of brought out that the town of Louisa, you know, is I think around 2,000 people. They have about the same police staff as I have. Hmm. And, you know, their budget's about the same, except, of course, uh, and, and they're, well, I think they're 1.8 square miles in size. No, Lord, yeah. You know, where we are 9.5 square miles, we have close to 12,000 people. Yeah. We have 62 miles of private roadway um, with the exact same budget and staffing that that little town has. Whereas the town of Farmville, which is roughly 8,500 people, I think it's about seven square miles, you know, their police budget's over $2 million. Gads. So, and I'm, by all means, I'm not saying we need a $2 million police budget, but I'm just saying with what we work with, we, I think we do pretty well. I don't oh. think a lot of people realize how big Mon Lake Monticello is. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, if it was a town based on us looking on the internet, we're the ninth largest town in Virginia. So right. I mean, this is a good size, you know, residential area. Right. No. So we're getting we're getting a lot of service for our money, or except for I was going to say bang for our buck, but I don't <laughs> know if that's the best thing with police work. Yeah. But, no. But anyway, I mean, we do the best we can with what we that's, have. Uh, that's 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 very good, and so. Uh, uh, we're we're doing in a sense we're we're doing pretty darn well in that well, comparison. We are, and that's why it's very important that we partner with the sheriff's office to you know maximize our levels of service. You know, roughly forty percent, thirty-five to forty percent of the county's population is in Lake Monticello. Yeah. Yep. So again, we'd be foolish not to utilize those services uh, to to maximize all our dollars, be it our dues or our tax dollars. Uh, so we know what's, and plus it helps that I worked there for 16 years and was second command. So I, ha sure. I know some people. Right. So it helps us, you know, merge those services together where we don't provide too much overlap and we can each do what we do best. Oh, that's you know, great. And I want to be, we can't be a full service law enforcement agency. We don't have the staff, we don't have the money, and that's not really what the residents want. But we can be a really good at our small core function, which is serving our community the best mm -hmm. we can. Oh, excellent. Anything else you want to say to us or the folks at home? Or? No, I just appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of a learning curve coming from government from my whole career to a HOA, learn how everything operates. Um, everybody here has been super friendly, uh, very supportive of everything we're trying to do, which is reassuring. Um, so just bear with me, you know, we've got a, I think the rockiest part is behind us and, you know, hopefully a little bit smoother sailing will be ahead of us. Well, David Wells, thank you for uh, for being here, for being uh, on Spotlight. I, I can't say for uh, being at the lake since you've been at the lake for 14 years already, but uh, for what you're doing and uh, for what you're contributing uh, to all of us. So uh, thank you very much again, and we wish you all the best of luck and certainly all success for all much. of us. Thank you, sir.
We've been speaking with David Wells, Lake Monticello's Director of Public Service and Chief of Police. We hope that you will join us again for future spotlights whenever they may occur up on Channel 977 and on YouTube. So until then, on behalf of the LMOA Broadcast Group, I'm Ron, I'm Ron Krause. Thank you and good day. <laughs>